just basically go straight down, you hammer down on this, it drives it in. Once you get it in, you pull to the side, you don't pull straight up. If you pull to the side, it flips that stake. And I believe you just about catch a B9 bulldozer with that and not get him. He can't, he can't get loose, you know. Uh, coyote, he ain't gonna pull that out of the ground. That's an 18 inch um, cable stake is what it is. And then you can see how that operates. Uh, if you pull straight up on it, that sleeve will come up. And we're talking about chain length and everything. Where you can get away with that is, is that I was talking to you about the, the uh, my uh, shock absorbing device. And you can see here, I run a shock absorbing device on mine as well. This is trapped straight out of the box. I have came in here and put uh, this is J.C. Connor shock spring is what it is and all that thing does is, is it compresses as that animal lunges it gives a little bit of pull and a resistance and it eliminates that animal from damaging his foot because sometimes if the market's right I'll sell live to a live market and I want to have good feet on the coyote when I do that I don't have no cut marks on the paw at all a lot of times if you can't get a cut Sometimes you get an animal that really fights a trap really hard and you and you need the doctor on him. I use that blue uh, side. You can get it uh, tractor supply. You use it a lot for cow feet and stuff like that. I just keep some of that in the box, in my toolbox area on the truck. And I'll just swab that thing on the foot. It's an antiseptic. And that in a day or two, his foot's, you'll hold him for a day or two. Sometimes they'll make you hold him for a week or more in the pen. But that means you've got to feed them and water them and take care of them while they're in there before you can sell your, fo your coyotes and, and your foxes. Uh. But uh, that's my basic rig. That's an MB550 trap. It's uh, two coil. I do run some four coil. I don't find the need for it here in North Carolina because we're not like we're in Wisconsin or somewhere like that where you get hard freeze downs. We do get hard freeze downs here, but not like they do up there where it freezes days on end, you know, and you have to have a trap that really will blow out of the ground and catch that animal when he puts his foot on it. And that has a whole different technique for having to catch animals in the snow and, and the ice up there. So, but down here, I don't find that the need here. But that's what I use. I run an 18 inch cable stake, shock spring, and trap straight out of the box. And, I, and with the offset jaws, I can get away with the length of chain, I can get away with the, uh, the trap, the way it's already set up, it's ready to go. That's a rigged out coyote rig right there. I catch a lot of coyotes on the farm, uh, do a lot of damage control work on farms and things, um, because this time of the year, cows are dropping calves and coyotes will prey on them. You take a young calf and coyotes are learning now that they can pack up, you get one coyote, and not so much, he has a time getting a calf down with a cow or a bull in the pasture. But you get two coyotes and they're, they're better apt to be able to take an uh, animal down like that. And uh, when you start getting three or four coyotes in there, then you, they're beginning to pack up. Uh, <laughs> one technique I like to use is when I'm going out and I'm scouting areas for, for trapping, particularly if I get a new farm, and a lot of my deals are word of mouth because I go into the local stores up there and the guy goes, oh, here's my trapper here. He's going to be catching coats on my farm. And well, the guy says, well, I got 200 acres down here. You can come down here and catch coats on my place. So word of mouth gets you a lot of a lot of permissions to be able to get in on land and stuff. You know, the other night, up at Baker's, where we had that, I went home two o'clock in the morning. I bet there's 15 hauling up the boathouse. Yep. Same night. Yep. <laughs> And the thing is, is that when you, when, when I get out at uh, early in the morning, late in the evenings, and they like to howl during that time. I mean, they howl whenever they want to howl, but they're most active during those times. And I'll get out there during those times, and I'll say, well, I got a pack here, and I got a pack over here, and I got maybe two or three over here, and they're howling in different areas. Well, I want to be, I don't want to go straight to those areas. I want to be that interloper. I want to get between those packs and that's where I want to key in on setting those areas up. That's how I try to figure out where the ant local animals are. 
on a macro scale, on a big scale, people say, well, how do I figure out where I'm going to trap? It's where the highway meets the railroad grade. The number one railroad, uh, number one dispersal route for coyotes in North America is the railroad grade. He hits the track and he can go north, south, east, and west. Your river systems are another, another deal where your river systems overlap those areas like the interstate highways, I-77, I-40. Coyotes travel up and down these corridors here. Prime example was we did a study down at uh, Fort Bragg uh, military base. We caught 80 coyotes down there, tagged them, put uh, radio track and telemetry collars on them, and we put microchips in their neck. And we tracked them over uh, a year, I guess it was, and we got that data on their travel routes. The interesting thing about it is, is that we re-released them on the base, and one coyote that was tagged went all the way to the Florida Georgia state line. That's a pretty good track for a coyote traveling north and south. And then one went, to, one actually traveled north and went to Washington D.C. I guess they figured out what was up there and turned around and came back. Yeah. You know? But but just over three or four days time, they actually travel those distances. You know, when you get thinking about it, well, it makes sense. If I hop on this railroad track, where will it take me? You know, and where you got, you're actually going through farmlands and stuff like that, and they'll just drop off into the area and set up house, you know. And that's where we come into play as trappers, trying to take those animals out of those areas. That's on the big scale. So figure out where your road systems are, your lake systems are, your river systems are, where they overlap and cross each other. Then you can take a plat book or a, or a topo map and start figuring out Right here's gonna be a fur zone, or here's gonna be a fur zone. You can kind of figure out those areas, and then you can go up there and knock on doors, you know. Then you start narrowing it down to the micro scale. Where am I actually gonna place this trap here? And why would I place this trap? This is the location here, and, and just right here, you got two roads coming in together. It's a good point. You got animals traveling this road, animals traveling this road, and animals coming up this road. They'll cross but they got to pass by a trap. So I would definitely pick a location like this on either side of the road. I pick one here because you catch animals that'll walk the other side of the road too. So I, I put one here, one here. Usually if I set one trap, I usually set three or four. The only way you're going to catch multiple, multiple animals is if you put more traps out. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you put a trap here, I put one here because they run in pairs sometimes. Sometimes they're running threes and fours, and you stand a chance of getting a triple or a double. And nothing no more cooler than come up and you got three coyotes bouncing in the trap when you get there, you know. And picking those areas out is pretty cool. Uh, when you're on a, when you're in a situation where you got a lot of cutovers and you got roads that come out of the woodlot into those cutovers, that's a good location. You got those two corners there where that road pops out into the cutover. Set both those corners. You know, set one across the way to the edge of the cutover because those animals are traveling those trails, those deer trails and game trails in and out of those areas. Those are good locations for sets, for particularly picking out those things. When you're looking for farmland, I'm looking for rolling hills. I got a farmer right now and he'll brag on me for the fact that, that I got in the truck and showed me the area. He was taking me across his pasture and we went across the place and I went, right here's where I'm going to put the first trap. And he looked at me real funny, he said, why did you pick this area? Well, why I picked it was, is from the bottom of the pasture, there's a low dipped in area. It, it came in, it's like a, a gully or a funnel, and it comes to the top of the pasture. So any place that provides any cover for that animal, you got to think like a coyote a little bit. you got to think like a game animal, because what happens is, is that game animal wants to stay below the line of sight. If you're deer hunting and old big old rack buck, if you're a 10 point buck and you don't want to get shot and killed, what are you going to do? You don't get to be a 10 point and be stupid, right? So you might make one mistake and get by and maybe he misses, the hunter misses you, but then you ain't going to make that mistake again, right? You're going to learn from that mistake. Coyotes are no different. You might pinch him one time and he ain't going to forget that trap was there the next time, you know? And you may get him to come back in again, but you better have your game on when he comes back in again. You may not catch him in this set here that you make, but you might catch him in the set across the way. But you have to do a little bit of things different. 
My number one set is a dirt hole set. That's taking more coyotes than, than you can think of. My number two set is a urine post set. I set it a lot. If I set a dirt hole set with bait and lure in a hole, I almost always set a, a urine post set. I give them something to pee on all the time because it's territorial to them. And they love marking territory. So being able to mark that territory, it tells the other coyotes in that area, this is my turf. If you come in here, I'm gonna fight you. If you come in here, this is my turf. It's like a turf war. But when you go in there and you catch the, the pair out of there, you catch the, the pack that's in that area out of there, what makes an area a key area is you look where, like if here's a town, you look where this is the township, you got a river system coming here, you got a railroad grade coming there, and they cross. So those are two key areas that's gonna bring animals into your area to replace the animals you just trapped. So one farmer said, I caught 28 coyotes off his one track of land. He had a narrow piece of land that was real narrow. It ran like uh, 350 yards down this way and then, and then you know, it, it come into a power line and the power line is another travel corridor for a coyote too, you know. So you got a creek system, a power line, and I had gullies. So I keyed in on those areas and that's where I started picking coyotes up at. And by picking those coyotes up in those areas, I was saving him calves so he could take to the market and sell and put money in his pocket. So what little bit of money he's spending to have me come in there and catch coyotes for him through the fall and the, and the spring of the year and the summer, uh, year-round coyote trapping, he, it's putting money in his pocket. He sees the benefits from it. So there, he's basically using me as a wildlife management tool to be able to harvest the coyotes out of there to protect his livestock. And that's a big, that's a big doggone help to him. Because I asked the man, I had a farmer over there and he's losing cows, he's using young calves and cows. Uh, he had registered black Angus cows and he was losing them at a rate of about two calves every week. And that begins to dig in the farmer's pocket after a while. So what we did was, is I went in, they had made a fresh kill, they killed a cow, just giving birth to a calf. They killed the calf as it was coming out of the birth canal, and then they turned around and they ate the whole hams and everything out of the cow alive. She laid there alive when they ate her. So the farmer said, yeah, I definitely want you to do something. So I came in there and set the carcass up, and I caught 18 coyotes around that thing. He was infested with coyotes in that area. But he had a river system that ran right through the area, which is a prime example. Power lines that ran through, and I keyed in on those areas. If I set a carcass or something like that, I always set a back away from it, 50 yards or so, because you got non-targets here, skunks, coons, buzzards, and things like that. And I promise you, you catch one or two buzzards, you don't want to release many. I mean, you got to release them, but you don't want to have to deal with them. You know, so they just kind of puke on everything and they create a mess, you know. But um, you'll catch a buzzard occasionally. But I always pull my sets back from it rather than go in tight to the carcass. People go, well, I sit around the carcass. Well, you can do that, but you're going to catch a lot of non-target animals. And we're after the coyote anyway is what we're after. Trap placement is a key. One thing that I have done is, and I've learned over time, that, and it works well for me, and I, like I say, I've caught 140 coyotes this year already. So, I mean, you, when you start catching coyotes in numbers like that, then you're doing something right, I think, you know, you're doing something right. So, back nine inches from a dirt hole set, I use a set back nine inches from the front edge, not the center of the hole, not the back of the hole, but the front edge of the dirt hole set. I set back nine and all three inches to the right or the left. Why is that important? It's important because you're trying to get your, that animal put his foot in a, on a place three inches in diameter. Now, there's an art to that, getting him to do that. And guiding that foot, subtle guiding that foot, getting him to subconsciously not pay attention to what's there and put his foot in one spot is key. So back nine inches from the front edge of the hole, three inches to the right or left. If you pinch him by a toe and you, that trap's not exactly where it needs to be, you pinch him by the toe and he, pop, he turns around and he pops that toe off, he's gonna be off on that right foot. This is why it's important. 
prime example was I caught a, a coyote by the toe, he popped the toe off. Three days later, the farmer called me and said, I got a coyote down here, he's off on his front right foot. I didn't tell him I'd caught that coyote before. But a cow had given birth and the placenta was laying on the ground. So the coyote, being an opportunistic animal that he is, went down there to go eat the placenta. That's high in protein. That's a, that's a, that's a score for a coyote. So he went down there to eat. And the landowner had a tenant that was across the street watching. So she reported, I got down there to the area and said the coyote was running off, he's off on his right foot. So I went in there and set the left foot. Next morning I came in there, coyote's in the trap. Picked the right foot up after I dispatched the coyote, toes missing. And when I got three toes, I got it. So that's why it's important to know where to place that trap. 27,000 times USDA did a test on setting traps and mock sets is what they did. They took the ground and Mary tilled it up and got just a real nice bed and they took two inch PVC pipe simulating the pan on the trap and placed it in different locations. But they put like lure and bait in like a, a hole and then so many inches back until they come up with this thing. 27,000 times a coyote step back nine and all three to the right or the left. Now why would you not use that data to your benefit? That's scientific data that's been proven by the USDA. USDA federal trappers, they have done this, they have trapped coyotes, they've shot them, they've dug them out of holes, knocked them in the head, they've done everything they could do to eliminate the coyotes. And you still have, they still haven't eliminated. The coyotes are here, they're here to stay, but learning to trap them and trap them properly is the main key. That's on traps. Talk a little bit about uh, catch pole. If you're gonna handle coyotes, you need a good catch pole. Tomahawk is a good brand. <coughs> and this is a catch-all. It takes a little bit, it, they cost, they're a little expensive. This is about a hundred dollar catch pole. They're a little expensive, but if you, it only hurts one time to buy good equipment. An old trapper friend of mine told me that a long time ago. If you buy good equipment, you take care of it, it'll last you a lifetime. So a good catch pole is essential for handling coyotes, particularly if you're selling to the live market. So what you want is a good catch pole. It's got a good swivel on the end of it, like this one, and he can rotate. You're fighting that coyote, you got it over his head, and you're fighting him here. This is five foot, and that keeps me away from them teeth on the other end. I don't want to get bit. I hadn't been bit, knock on wood. I don't want to get bit at, at all, but you can prevent that by handling the animals in, the, in a professional manner there. You put that on him, you pin him to the ground, you take his foot out of the trap, and then you can do what you want to with him. You can either release him, and this is good for releasing non-target animals as well, buzzards in particular. It keeps you away from that sharp beak he's got too. You know, you can kind of direct that head in a new direction. You can sense this down to where you don't actually hurt the animal. You can control the head, where the teeth and the beaks are or whatever. So that's a good, that's a good investment right there. A catch pole. I highly recommend buying one. You know, tomahawk is when you're leading brand. Most of your tomahawks and your uh, catch alls is what your professional dog catchers use, and your uh, uh, government trappers use. They use these types. You, you can get these cheaper versions, but and they'll work. But you said you get bit. You know, and I don't want you to get bit for nothing in the world. That's why we're here talking about equipment and talking about what to do. Um, that's a good catch pole there. As you can see, I use a lot of different things. I got my trapper bag organized here. We'll kind of go through it a little bit right quick. I got bones for sets that I use. I use a lot of bones. And this is just an old cow leg bone. And you can see it's been busted out. I'll tuck lure down in here. Makes a good lure holder. Protects it from the rain that we've been having here lately. Lay that bone out there and I'll put three holes under here and put different three smells in there. And I'll give them different things to look at, you know. That sticks out like a sore thumb. He's running down this road and this is laying here. He can see that. He automatically can see that. That's an eye attracting, that's eye appeal to him. He runs down that road and he said, that wasn't there yesterday when I came through here. He's over here investigating. 
when he gets over here, there's a trap sitting there. He just doesn't know it yet. And then I got him hooked up. But that's a highly uh, vertebrae in a cow's back. If you know old farmer, he's got a place that he dumps carcasses at, that's a good place to go harvest your bones at and get. That's great for eye appeal right there. Now you look at a tire here. I use this set a lot when trapping on livestock. And I'm gonna demonstrate the tire set here in just a minute. Um, what I do is I found that a 14 inch tire is probably your best tire to use. This set right here uh, has been around probably close to 100 years. They developed this set, the USDA did, when they were trapping following the cattle herds and the sheep herds out west because they had to come up with a set to keep the, the sheep and the, and the animals and the cows out of the set. Because most invariably, when you set that trap and you walk away from it, a cow's over here sniffing around. They're curious by nature and they'll pop the trap and then your trap's ineffective now. So setting this is what, what I do. And this is how I do that. I'll come in here and I'll set this trap. It's not a hard trap, I'm not in a hard setup. But I'll come in here and I use different gloves when I do. Just so they're using that. I got a set, this is my gloves I use to make sets with. And I got gloves that I strictly handle nothing but lure with. Just one thing, you can walk on up while you see what he's doing. You don't have to stand way back yeah, here. You guys can gather around and you can see what's going on. I don't bite, I promise. It's not hard anyway. Uh, <laughs> this set is not a hard set. It's just as simple as it can be but it's really effective. Uh, do that. Let's see here. Let's do something. Oh, Pick me a trap. Sounds like you're feeling physical. Yeah, I'm <laughs> used like to it. Some rock there. <laughs> I'm gonna break out the jackhammer in a minute. <laughs> I don't have to get my sifter here before long. I'm about wore this and that. JB well. <laughs> I see something like that for sure. Don't you have I'm another talking. one at the house though? Yeah, I got I was going to say, I, I figured you had another one. One thing up here, you're probably not going to be a loss for rocks up here. Yeah. As you see, I'm on a kneeling pad. I highly recommend don't wear leather boots or anything like that. Coats are pretty sensitive. To, I mean, they tolerate human scent somewhat, but then they get to the point that, uh, particularly if you're on farms or you're around houses or you know uh, area that's got some tracks of land, I always uh, I always try to wear rubber knee boots. You know, knee boots is what I wear. I wear the lacrosse. I, wear, I have a knee pad um, when I, uh, I got gloves on when I'm handling. I make sets with these when I'm handling lure and bait. I use these rubber gloves, these rubber gauntlets. Why? Because I don't want to be getting those smells mixed up with me handling traps and whatnot. Uh, I have another bag set up for if I make a catch, then I'll, I'll actually use that bag to make catches with. This is my setup bag. I have a bag identical to this with the same stuff in it where I can go to and I can pull out and I can make sets with or remakes. After I make a set, I can make a remake with that. When I dig a trap bed out, I dig that out in a bowl because I don't want that trap to be bedded down when I dig it. So I'm digging that trap out in a bowl like that. And you'll see how easy this trap beds down. You got about 20 minutes left. Well, what I do is I come over here and I'll dig my chain here. And what I do is I'll drive my chain here, okay? But for 
trapping purposes in time. I'm going to pull this away and show you what I do. Some people like the dog away from them. I prefer the dog to me when I'm setting the trap. Get that spot on. I lay this in here on the shock spring and I bed this trap right in here, just like this. I push this dirt back over this. That animal steps down, he's not stepping on, on the chain or spring. He do, I, I don't give him anything, any reason not to step here, okay? Now, unless you've worked with traps a lot, you saw me put my hands on the inside of that jaw on that trap, that could be a no-no to you if you're not careful. All right, we're gonna pack dirt in around this. Set here. And what I'm looking for is, is I want to put this here. Pack the dirt in good and tight around the jaws. And I'm going to test it. And you saw that, and that trap didn't move at all. If that trap shifts and moves under his feet, he'll pick that foot up, and he'll go dig. So your trap needs to be clean, needs to be boiled, dyed, and waxed. You don't have to wax them, but you boil them. I use speed dip on them, and I've done that. If you're in a, you're in a roll and you're doing that, I have sifted out peat moss here, is what I got. And what that is, is I spots where he's going to put his foot. I know here's the dog of the trap. The pan's sitting right here. So I'm going to take this and move this out a little bit. Kind of guide his foot. So just slowly guide his foot where it's at. I may come in here and do this too. I'm about to set the trap off. I ain't careful. I may come in here too and set a little uh, stone or something. When I pick a stone up, I pick it up clean side up, dirty side down. That's it. This is about two o'clock. This is going to be about ten o'clock. And I'm going to come in here and take a stone similar to that, and I'm going to guide that foot a little bit. Put it right here. It says, "Don't step here. Don't step here. And don't step here." And they have a one low spot here that I want him to put his foot. And that's very important, right there. I'll put that there. Put this back in my bag. And here's how this tire works. Bring your tire over. I'm going to center this right here. So you got nine inches, nine inches, nine inches, nine inches. And right there is where he's going, is the sweet spot where he's going to step. What makes this set so good is this. I'll put lure, I'll put, I'll put my bait here underneath the rim of the tire. I'll put it under the rim of the tire here. I use sheep's wool. It's what I use when I'm handling this. I'm changing over to this. I'll put these rubber gauntlets on because you don't want all that smell in the truck. You don't want it on your face. You might have to pick a booger or something. You never know. You don't want to get skunks in up your nose. You only do it one time, I promise. But I usually use a little bit of this. This is Mark June's Widowmaker with persimmon seeds. I use a lot of Mark June stuff. I'll take a little bit of this. Doesn't take much. And I'll stick it right here. Right, right there under the rim of the tire. So I'll stick that there. <clears throat> Um, I use different lures. Uh, here's one of my favorites. I use Wind Walker. A lot, a lot. I could probably set this trap here and anchor it, and there'd be something here in the morning. It's got a skunky smell to it. It'll stink up your car or your vehicle. A lot of skunky smell. You can smell it all the way Wind over Walker, here. A lot. I use another lure here, it's called Fox Frenzy. It's got fox glands and stuff in it. And it's really a good lure for 
uh, mixing up. I give the animal different smells. I'll put that, I'll put my wind walker probably on the inside here because that, that is kind of loud and it gets up on the airwaves and as the wind blows, it, the animal can smell it. Don't discredit the coyote's nose. He's got a heck of a nose. He's got a really good nose on him. I'll use that. Uh, uh, Song Dog Supreme has uh, coyote glands in it. I use, uh, and this is uh, Silent Stalker. This is another one. It's got cat glands in it. And see, you'll catch a lot of bobcats. You catch it. It's a good set. It'll use, you use it for bobcats, you use it for coyotes, but it's really good, particularly if you're setting in livestock. This this is a uh, silent stalker for fun of you. I have a, a gusto here. It's what probably some of you smelled it a little bit ago. This is gusto by my Tim Caven. It's got the skunky smell to it too. Uh, think about skunks. Let's talk about that a little bit. Skunks. Uh, when you see a canine, and he finds a skunk. What does he do? He runs up there and he rolls in it, right? It's just a natural thing for him to do. So why would that not work? Coyotes, a canine, you know, you catch a lot of foxes, a lot of red and grays, particularly on farms, I catch a lot of reds, <laughs> but I can't keep them, so I have to release them. I love to catch them, but I can't keep them. So my target animals are coats, but that's basically the tire set right there. I put the, I use, I use a multitude of different stuff. I've been testing this this is one of the guys in Trapper Association, his ADC Trapper. He makes this lure here. It's called uh, Murphy's Pinky Stinky is what it is. It's, it's just basically uh, a petroleum-based type deal, but it smells like skunk. It's really loud, but it really sticks to what you're using. So if it's raining or something like that, it still holds that odor. Even after a good hard rain, these animals are traveling after a good hard rain still they got to eat every day. They got to make a living out here to survive, you know. So stuff like that I use. I use a lot of bobcat glands, just regular glands and coat glands and pop glands. I use a lot of that too. Uh, another go-to lure here is called uh, Violator Number Seven. It's got a real loud smell to it. It's got a skunky smell. It's kind of subtle. It's not near as loud as the Wind Walker is, but it's really good stuff. And Caden makes it. Uh, one thing that I liked about the Violator 7 was at one time Tim was actually sending calling cards back to our military uh, overseas so they could call home and tell mom and dad it was okay. So I figured if I could spend a little bit of money and donate a little bit of my money to let a soldier call home and tell mom and dad it was okay, that was my little tribute to them to help them. Because I, you know, I really highly believe in our military and what they do for us out here. <clears throat> any questions or any uh, about anything I've said so far? What's that? You're not putting bait in there for He can eat it if he can get to it. But the interesting thing is, he's got to step here. And when he steps in here, he's automatically going to step in that low spot. But to step in here, he's got to turn his head to get up in there and lick at it and bite at it. So he's paying more attention to the bait underneath there, under the rim. And the lure and the good smells I got out here, I always use multiple smells. I never just put one out, I put multiple smells out. And I'll switch it up. I've used beaver caster. I, you know, maybe, maybe I've run for 18 days and not got a hit on it. Now all of a sudden I want to change up, I'll put beaver caster out or something. And he hadn't smelt that before. I come in the next morning, boom, I got a coyote in the trap, you know. And I always find that after a good hard rain, if I come in and I set everything up the night before after a good rain and I relure everything, I don't mess or putter around sets, I don't. I'll ride by them at a distance and look at them. I might ride from here to that crane to it and look at it through binoculars. If there ain't nothing there, there ain't no need for me to go over there. Because what am I doing? I'm putting human scent out there. I don't want to put no more scent than I need to have out there. So what I do is, is I check them from a distance. If that trap's not tripped, I have no reason to be over there. It, I had a trap set there for 28 days before it made a hit. But it sat there for 28 days and I got a hit. But I ever so often, periodically, I went back and I refreshed and 
I'll squirt urine up in the tire. I use Fox urine a lot. I use Bobcat urine a lot, and I use uh, Coyote urine a lot too. If I'm making a urine post set, I always use. Usually, I'll use uh, I'll use um, coat urine on a drop, and I'll take a piece of coat scat, and I'll put it right by the urine post set there, and uh, just I'll go over that right quick. Uh, basically, all I do is take about a bite of stick, probably about a foot long, and I'll. I'll stick that stick. Let me get that stick here. Mm -hmm. You got about 10 minutes, David. Alright. Gonna take him 10 minutes to break the stick. <laughs> Just a quick note on this stuff. Um, if I'm gonna use a stick similar to this, I'll come in here and uh, you can stick this stick up this way, it doesn't matter. You can stick it up that way. I don't like to put it that way myself, but remember, I'm trying to target that animal. You put it up this way, and a coyote will step back, and he'll, he'll urinate on this thing anywhere from here to here, all the way up through here. If I want to get this in my favor, I always turn the stick around this way. This is a little much long for me. I really like that stick a little bit. I like to sit it similar to this. What I'll do is, is I'll come in here and take a piece of, I always have my gloves on, I'll take a piece of Q-tip, I'll make a Q-tip out of it, that's what I'll do. I'll come in here and take a little bit of chew twirl, and I'll come in and wrap this around and make me a Q-tip here basically, around here. That's eye appeal too. Because when he comes down this road, he's going to see that, right? Now, this is a little close here. I'd probably come back to here because back nine and all three. Back nine and all three. Here's the center of the pan. I want to, I want him to walk up man. Now, most every time I'll use gland lure here. I'll use uh, bobcat. Uh, see, bobcats are something Coyotes like to eat too. They'll kill them and eat them if I can get to them. I use uh, coyote gland lure, bobcat gland lure, and fox gland lure, but I'll use little little drops here and there, and I'll put a coat drop in here, and I'll use coat urine here right by this. It gives you something to urinate on because this is a strange coat that came here. I'll pick droppings up on one farm to carry him from one farm to another farm because what that does is it messes with his mind. He's saying, well, what are they doing over here in my territory? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna whip their rear in and send them out of my territory. So that's a urine post set. I always make this set. If I set a, a baited set, I always, most I, every time set a urine post set to give them something to feed on. And then you'll pick double up. Oh, man. Here, or I'll go across the road and I'll set a flat set over there. 